Parsha's Truma. And it says, Vaidabra Hashem Moshe Lemur, a traditional introduction. Hashem tells Moshe the following that he should tell the Jewish people this. Dabero Bene Israel, tell the Jewish people, Vikuli Truma, me ace call each. You you should take for me Truma from each person. So the the first thing that they raise is that it's a funny expression. It should be that not that, that it should be that each person gives me Truma. Right? Each person should give it. Here it doesn't say it says kach. Kach means to take. Uh, you take chuma from each person. whose heart desires, tihu es chumasi, take my chuma. So the commentaries are saying that the reason that it it seems to be instead of somebody like normally what a person would give charity, you don't take charity. Right? In other words, I don't come and put a gun to your head and say, "Give me charity." I don't take it from you. You give it free will, right? And it says, take it for me, everyone whose heart chooses to give it. So how can that be that you are you have it in such a way? So from here, the commentaries tell us that we need to understand that uh, that the um, calf does more for the cow than the cow for the calf. That is to say, the cow milk, you know, gives milk to the calf. But if the calf wasn't there to take the milk, the cow would be in pain, right? So here's the same idea, that... When you have a poor person, the poor person needs money to buy food. They'll starve, right? And so you'd say, well, when the rich person gives the poor person money to buy food, the rich person's doing a favor for the poor person. So for the, the re reason that the words here are reversed, it's coming to tell you that the, the poor person does more for the wealthy person than the wealthy person does for the poor. While the wealthy person gives the poor person food, right, money for food, Right? The poor person gives the wealthy person eternity because they, they not only do they have merit for the world to come, but it also affects their, their personality. But the, the, to be a giver is, a, is, is really the basis of this world. To be a taker is not such a good thing. Now, now there's a whole you know, series of lectures on this topic of the idea of being a giver or a taker. And that, you know, you have, for instance, let's say you have a marriage. So if you have a marriage and both people in the marriage are takers, the marriage won't last because both people are taking from each other, but no one's giving. If you have a marriage that one is a giver and one is a taker, the marriage will last, but sooner or later it'll fall apart because the giver will keep giving until they're exhausted. And the taker, it's right, is unending. When you take, you just continually take. There is no ending to it. So then eventually they get to the point where the giver runs out of things to give. Right, of their time, their emotion, their heart, their feelings, and anything physical. But the taker keeps wanting it, so their marriage will dissolve. What has to be is that both of them are givers. And if a, if you have two people in a marriage, two people in a business, two people on the street who are givers, then then it will work. Because what eventually happens is that if you have a giver, when a giver takes, they're really giving. So we have an example here, but the best example is like when my kids would come home, like from school, when they're like eight years old, and they'd make it for Father's Day an ashtray, right? Besides the fact the ashtray would be crooked, and it would be funny looking, and it would be wrapped up in a piece of newspaper, and how, you know, crooked and so forth. Um, and I don't smoke, right? I don't know anybody who smokes. But nevertheless, right, you know, what happens, you take this ashtray, and you open it up, and you make a big deal out of it. And it is a big deal. I'm not saying you fake it, but you make a big deal out of it. What, so what are you really doing? You're really giving self-confidence to the child. Now, you're taking an ashtray, but who's getting more? Are you getting more when you get the ashtray, or is the child getting more by your taking it with such uh, noise and, and, and appreciation? Right. So the one who, who really, who the child is really getting much more. So here you see an example of, of, I'm taking an ashtray, but I'm really giving. He's giving an ashtray. We're both givers, right? And that's how, how it works, that, that a lot of times we have to learn how to be appropriate givers when we take. And you see this in many different ways. And it's very important that if we're givers in everything we do, then we will be able to have a much better life because a giver knows how to take as an act of giving as well. So that no matter what your situation is, 
So you could be simply having a conversation with a friend or a spouse. And you're having a conversation and you see that they're getting upset about something. And so, so you let them get upset, you know, and you help them and they, they talk it through. They feel better. And you, you can say, like, what are you getting upset with me for? I didn't do anything. Right? That's a taker. I'm not taking this from you. Right? A giver would let them, you see what's going on. You let them work it through. Help them so they'll feel better and you'll feel better. You end up to, so that they, they give and you give. And that's really the basis of all human interaction, right? What we call social intercourse between two people, many people, groups of people. If everyone is a giver, then everyone gets much more. And it's just a frame of mind, right? Because if you have a taker, even when a taker gives, they're really taking. Right? And when, you know, you say, yeah, there's no such thing as a free lunch. You know, you, like, let's say, you know, I was, uh, whenever I go on a vacation, you always have these people a costume. You can go to Las Vegas and they want to sell you condos. And you go to a resort and they want to sell you timeshares. Right? And they're all real nice, right? But they all have an ulterior motive, right? It's a known ulterior motive, but it's an ulterior motive. You know that whatever they give you, they really want to take much more, or they may be taking much more. Right? When, when somebody acts like that, you know, those are takers. And takers right, will only give if they expect to get more back. So if you're in a relationship, even in a marriage, and a person is a taker, so they'll take whatever you give them. But even when they give to you, they're giving you a small amount of something in order because they expect they're going to get something larger back. Right? You see, it's obvious with a child because child, children have not, haven't learned to be subtle. So, you know, if your child wants something, you see that they act differently, right? And it's obvious that they want they want something, right? And even when they get older, it's obvious. You know, they, they, you get a call from one of your kids, right? And they, and they don't usually call you on a Tuesday. And they're calling you and you're saying, oh, I'm just calling to say hi. Well, and then you say, what's going on? Yeah, well, by the way, you know, I'm having some real problems. I've got to pay this bill. Any chance you might be able to send me a couple of dollars, right? So what was the purpose of the call? So if they're takers, right, then, then the purpose of the call was really the money. It doesn't mean they don't want to talk to you or they don't care for you. All of it is probably true. But that's, that's what a taker does. A taker wouldn't think of calling you unless they would get something. A giver would call you just because they know that you enjoy speaking to them. And they might even take something from you because they know that you enjoy giving it. Right? That's that's really the difference, and we feel it ourselves when you when someone does that to us. It's just that when it's people we care about, we pretend not to notice it, but we can feel it ourselves. And that's what it's talking about here: that if we have a world full of givers, where everybody gives, and that everything you do is an act of giving, then everybody gets. That's what happens. Right? I, I say sometimes when it comes to intimacy, you can see this when it's intimacy. Right, they know they in the world they talk about how intimacy is dirty, that it's something that's that it's that it's, that it's a dirty thing, and it, and what I believe is it's dirty if you're a taker, if my interest in another person is what I'm going to get out of it, how good I'm going to feel, then that's dirty because I'm only care about me, I don't care about you, but if I'm in an, involved in a relationship of, with intimacy then I'm giving to my partner, and my partner is giving to me. We're both receiving. But, the, but that's the difference between love and, the, let's say, sex. That's the difference. Right? You can An act of love is physically the same thing as, as an act of sex, but an act of love is the people who are doing it are giving to each other. I want to do this for my partner in a way that nobody else can. And an act of sex is I want to feel good. I mean, that's why when you have prostitution, I don't care about her. I pay her, right? That's dirty. Is there really blinking on this? Right? That's camera? already low risk. Yes, okay, so that's a good sign. Believe it or not, the red light blinking is good. So it can okay. be a physical good activity. Good afternoon and, and welcome. Sexual abilities. It can be conversation. It can be in every part of our life, but as long as we are givers, then we will get, but everything is, the, is, is different. And we find over and over and over again that giving okay. is really one of the fundamental hey, good ideas. Good afternoon and teachers, welcome. That our, we should be live, live our lives as givers in everything we do, and you'll never lose out.
you'll, you'll always take back. It doesn't mean you have to be foolish, and you you know you give everything away, right? You know, like it says in the Torah that you have to give tzedakah. You have to give ten percent of your money to tzedakah. But you know, most people don't know that there's also in the prophets a curse to a person who gives too much, gives too much money. What is too much money? It's not necessarily a percentage. It means that, for instance, let's say, you know, Mr. X is a very wealthy person. He's got in, in millions of dollars in holdings, and and his income this year is a million dollars. So he has he has to give ten percent, hundred thousand dollars. He has to give to charity. Could he give a million dollars? Sure, he's got a hundred million dollars of holdings. He can give all his salary away, right? So if he would give away ten percent, he fulfills the mitzvah. What if he wants to give fifteen percent? He'd be allowed to because it doesn't affect his life. It won't affect him. He's got a hundred million dollars in the bank. So what if he gives an extra fifty thousand dollars to charity? It has no effect on him, his wife, his kids, nobody, right? But if the man's making $100,000 a year and he has to give 10000 to charity, and he, for whatever reason, is moved by someone, and he wants to give $50,000 away, so now what's going to happen is that his whole family is going to feel it. He won't be able to pay bills. He won't be able to do this or do that. He says, but I did a mitzvah. Look at it. I gave $50,000 and I helped the poor. Right? But, you, but you did it to a point where God is saying, I'm giving you this $100,000 a year. This is what I allocate to you. Now, in that $100,000 a year, I'm allocating $10,000 for you to give to that person. And that person just needs it, right? And that's how I'm getting the money to him, is through you. But, it, but you need $90,000. If you give away 30 of that 90, right? So now you're giving away $40,000, you won't have what you need. So, so the, the prophet tells us from God that you'll be cursed, that you will lose that money. So you will. You, you think you can live on sixty? You're going to get sixty. Right? Just like we say the opposite way. When it says that when God gives you hundred thousand dollars and you give ten thousand dollars to charity, it doesn't make it easy. Let's say you make five hundred thousand dollars. Right? I'm not saying that, uh, that you need it to live on. You make enough money that you have more than you need to live on. If you make five hundred thousand dollars, you have to give fifty thousand to charity. Right? So you you do that. You can live on the rest of the money. Right? It's possible with no problem. I have extra money. And you can give more. But to, but to do it to the point where it affects you in a negative way means that you're saying that God was wrong. It's our way of saying, well, God gave me too much. He shouldn't have given me so much. But no, he, he knows you need a certain amount. And we know that when you give, he, he it says that when God gives you money and you give a portion of charity, then he, re he rewards you by giving you more money. So that you can give more to charity, right? The same thing happens in reverse. If you overdo it, then it takes into account that you're you're saying I'm giving you too much, then you'll get less, right? And that's and it works both ways. But it's only if the giving of the extra money has a negative effect on your family, not if it just uses some of your holding. Right? That's not a problem. So um, this idea of uh, if you look in the, in this first so there are two here, different says, suggestions that I see. One suggestion, which is from the Mia Mikra East, puts forth, Malvin puts it forth as well, is that the original is gone. Of what everybody you don't have the original, has, and they don't I want you to give back. What they have is a document that reported what had been decreed at the time. And you know the way it works. Some documents were going to emphasize some things, and some documents were going to the well. Someone's got to pay for the electricity, whatever it is. got to pay for it. That's done through this truma. But, but Rashi says, he, he adds two words which seem to be funny. He says, the yikuli truma, take from me truma. And then Rashi's bothered by it. Something's wrong with these words there. And he answers the problem by saying, me. take the truma for me in my name. Because the original is gone. Well, what, we don't have the original, and they don't need it. God says, take the truma. What they have is, my wife has to say, for me in my name. Well, who else are you taking? And you know the way it works. So so Rashi is explaining this something because it's bothering him. Go, uh, well, because well, everything is God's. Right? If, you, if you have a child, or you create an idea, or you build something, it's yours. It's your child. It's your idea. It's your object. Right? God created everything. So it's all his. So when when God gives me $100,000 a year to live on, it's his money. He's just giving it to me. right? But it's, it's God's. I'm God's. So of course, right, the money is God's. So how could it be that God says, okay, I'm going to give you $100,000. I want you to give me back 10%. Right? 
it's all his anyways. He all hundred thousand is his. He has a true ownership of it. So when it says Vayiku di Truma, right, to me for my and for my sake, God is saying, I'm giving human beings the ability to have ownership. That you fill it. You do it. We do it with our children, right? When we give them of allowance, what, of what, went what is allowance? That's the idea. Come, and there they, is and they, evidence you know, to support. You give. You support your children. <laughs> My part of supporting them is giving them the ability to buy some things that they might want. So you don't think they walk home from school, they want an ice cream, so they have a dollar. They buy ice cream. They want to get a coat, they have a dollar. Right? Whatever they, you know. So you give them a few dollars, so they shouldn't walk around with no money in their pocket, right? So why do you get? Why do you get? There is evidence allowance? to support right? this what, in what our text as well. Because if you look at the wording, is that you're telling at the end of sentence two, you have the right of ownership. It says the thanks to the God of And everything and so you have is mine. But I'm going to give you this money. It's your, I won't tell you what to do. With here it. is a memory of it. Because you're teaching your child. Of it. Take responsibility it's not the. For uh, it's not the original. To deal with money. Now Malbim on that. Money. Right, so realize what it's worth. He says, so they don't of course, ask you for a thousand dollars. I know why they don't have they, the original. They have, they have to be reasonable. Come on. So they understand why how would money works. Something like that lying so, around. That's so it. So God's doing that. God's giving us the ability to own You feel that you own this money. You worked for it. It's yours. Of what went on. Now, I want you to give some back. That's not so easy for people. That's it, it isn't. Like I have a friend who has a business where his business is that he helps you with government grants. Right on. So he'll come in and he'll say, look, there's a grant, and, and I'll tell you about the grant, and you can do it yourself. That's the idea. There this is evidence to support this in our text as well. Because if you look at the, the words, the taxes that your organization pays, at the end of sentence two, to the provincial government, you're going to get that. It says, the thanks to All you, God, but be Right? And, and so you have to do an accounting. It, send it into them. That's all you got to do. You want to do it yourself? No, no, no. I, it's crazy. So I said, okay, I'll do it for you. I told you about the grant. I'll come in. I'll do it for you. I'll go through your books for you. I'll make out all the forms, and I'll send them in. You'll get a check. And here's what I want. You give me half of that check, and then every year from now on, you will automatically get money. I get none of it. Every year, the government will send you money because you've already filled out the forms. But the first year, you'll get extra money because it goes back a few years. I'll take half of that, and you get the rest. So everybody says, why not? The, the other half is found money. I wasn't going to get it anyway. So if I want to get $10,000 back, I'll give him five. I'll take five next year. So maybe I'll only yes. get three. And discuss this uh, assistance he gives for the building of the temple. Three. And yes, we'll have to discuss Of course, what do I got to lose? As, uh, if I say no, I get nothing. So, so this uh, way, I'll get $5,000 this year, right? So he tells me, and without that. fail, so many of the institutions, when they get the money, they don't. They want to renegotiate. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, five thousand dollars. We only got ten. You want half my money? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was our agreement. You would have no money if it wasn't for me. Now you got you got a gift of five thousand dollars, and I get five thousand dollars for my effort. Right? And then next year you got a gift of three thousand dollars, and I get nothing. Right? But nevertheless, he says so many times he has to argue with people, right? Because now that they got the money. It's different. It's like with the, the lawyers who do the, right, you know, work on spec, where you hear them on the radio all the time. Somebody gets into a car accident, and you sue the other person, right, and you'll, you'll get, you know, the, you'll go through court, and you'll get $30,000. And the, but the lawyer gets 30%. So everyone says, look, I'm getting $25,000. I wouldn't get it anyways. Yeah, the lawyer's going to take 10. So what? As soon as you get the money, the lawyers get, have to fight with you to get the money. That's so what the lawyers do now is they make it, the money goes to them, in and they give you as well, right? Because if you they have the to make the law. But you, on the other hand, can make their life miserable. That they'll have to sue you to get their their money. Because but at first, but when you they first come to you, you say, "Yeah, of course, you should have a third. I get two thirds. I don't have to do anything." Right? But it happens every time. So this is where we learn the lesson of keeping your word, paying your bills. Realizing that when God gives you money, it's still God. It's still from God. Yes, He wants you to feel an ownership. He wants you to administrate it. But now I want something back from you. You should give it to me because it's for the better, the better. It's for the greater good. But it does just like we do with our kids. So, that, so Rashi says that's why he says, "For me, in my name," God says, "Give it back to me." But it's all yours. You know? Ninety thousand is yours. Just give me the ten. 
That's not so simple. So that's why Rashi says it this way. Now, um, the next thing it tells us is very interesting. It says, what does God want? Like, what is he asking for? So it says here, this is the, this is the charity, right? The, the objects that I want. That I'll take from you. And here you have a very interesting list of, of precious items. Zahav, gold, keser, silver, nechoshes, is a brad, copper. Techelis. Techelis is this beautiful purple blue dye. I mean, you're supposed to wear them in your tzitzis, right? But the, it's the it's the color of royalty. So if you look in the English, turquoise, purple and scarlet wool, linen and goat hair, red dyed ramskins, tachash skins, acacia wood, oil for illumination, spices for anointment, oil and the aromatic incense. So if you stop there, you are, you what you will see if you look at this a few times is that it's a hierarchy. It starts with the most precious, and it goes to the least. Gold, silver, copper, right? We know gold is more, worth more than silver, silver more than copper, copper more than turquoise, right? Uh, um, uh, more than uh, wool, wool more than linen. In the old days, linen was cheaper. Uh, linen more than goat hair, goat hair more than the skin of a ram or of a worm. Uh, that's worth more than a piece of wood, and a piece of wood is worth more than oil. Oil is worth more than spices. Spices are worth more than incense. So it's a hierarchy going down. But I stopped in the middle of the sentence. Then it says, show them stones and stones for the settings for the ephod and the breastplate. These are jewels. These stones are rubies, sapphires, right? These are precious and semi-precious stones, right? So they're out of order. Gold, silver, copper going all the way down to oil, and then it says diamonds, rubies, and sapphires. It should say diamonds, gold, rubies, sapphires, silver, right? And that, because it's, you see, it's clearly going in the order of worth, but then at the end, it sort of jumps up, right? It's either that, or the Torah thinks that diamonds, rubies, and sapphires are worth less than incense. Clearly, they don't. So why is it, is it confusing like that? It seems to be the most expensive, little less, little less, little less, little less, most expensive. So that's because we're looking at this wrong. We're looking at this by the, what we would call the intrinsic value of the object. Like gold by the gram is worth more than silver by the gram. I mean, gold by the gram is certainly worth more than oil or spices, right? It looks that, right? And it comes to the physical worth. But here's something that, that we have to add. When the Jews were in the desert, that God is coming to them and saying, I want all these things. So they had gold and silver because they got it from Egypt. They had all the other things that they got from Egypt. What they didn't get from Egypt were the stones. All these stones. These stones they didn't have. The Egyptians didn't have, they didn't have diamonds and rat rubies to give, to give them. They didn't have them. So it says that when, they, when God wanted them, so the people wanted to give. And the people gave everything. Like they gave like, this was a building fund they had extra. They had leftover. Like, it was, yeah, people really opened their hearts. They just came out of Egypt. Right? They had, they had all this money, the new money that they got. They gave. In the end, they didn't have any diamonds or rubies or, right, they, just, they didn't actually ask for diamonds, but for rubies and sapphires, they didn't have it. So it says that because they wanted to give it, God made a miracle and these clouds came and they sort of rained the jewels. And the people were able to give the jewels. So, okay, so good afternoon. What, what is it telling you? Then? What it's telling you is that we're not, God is not saying this in order of the intrinsic value. He's talking about the amount of effort it takes you to give it. But if I would come to you and say, listen, can you give me $5? You wouldn't even ask me what it's for. You give me $5. If I say, can you give me $200? You'd say, like, what? What do you want $200? Right? You know, my son comes to me, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm going out, can I, can I have $20? Well, okay, I'll give you $20. He says, I'm going out, can I, can I have $300? $300? Where are you going? Where, where are you going? New York? What are you doing with $300? Right? So here, right, they ask for gold and silver. People are not going to be given it up so quick, right? It, it, it means something to them. So God's saying, based on your effort and your feelings, this is hard to give. But when but they got these stones for free. 
There was no effort put into the stones. They didn't work to get the stones. The stones were given to them. Therefore, God's saying, I want, I, I, I'm not just asking you for the, the object because of its worth. I want you, you to work on your personality. I want you to be a giver. I want you to change who you are. So the hardest thing for you to give is something you worked for that's worth a lot. That's gold. You worked for that. You worked, right? you worked as a slave. So you, you, that's hard for you to give up. Even incense, you worked for it. That's harder for you to give up than, than a ruby that you just found. That's, that's to you. It might have a real worth, but you doesn't have so much worth because you just found it. So he's saying when when it comes to giving, God is not as much interested in how much you give. It says how much, how hard is it for you to give? How much effort is there in your giving? How much are you giving up to give it? In the case of the stones, they're giving up nothing because they got it for nothing. But the other objects, they were giving up something because they worked for it. So that's the important thing. But the Torah is telling us it's not how much you give. It's that how much you feel it, how much it affects you. Right? So, so if for one person, like I say that sometimes when you know people come to me and they want to raise money and they'll ask me, do you have any connections? They'll say, you know, if you go to this guy, he'll give you $500. I, I would think that's how he says no. In other words, he's so he's wealthy enough and he's a big enough giver that that he might not be interested in your cause, but he'll give you five hundred dollars just because you asked him. Because for him, that's not a lot. Of, that's not money. That I mean, it's money, but it's not doesn't take a lot of effort. Another guy, you go to that guy and you ask him five hundred dollars. Just say five hundred dollars. I haven't given five hundred dollars to anyone in my life. I don't have that kind of money. I can give you fifty dollars, right? And that fifty dollars will will do will affect him more than the $500 from the rich guy who was just saying no. Even the $5,000 from the rich guy. This $50 is harder. So God is saying that's how we judge. We don't judge on it because I'm giving them the money. I'm, we judge on how much effort you put into it, how much care you put into it, how much it affects you, and you gave it anyways, that's what it's worth. Right? So you're saying the, the jewels, there was no effort. They're not worth as much that way. Are they financially worth? Well, yeah, they're financially worth more than gold. A, a big ruby is worth more than, than maybe copper or bronze. So certainly that you should, you know, you give that. It's, it has a worth. But if you didn't work for it, it doesn't mean anything to you. Now you see it sometimes with people who have, they win the lottery or they inherit a lot of money. And money becomes almost useless to them. Right? Almost because they didn't work for it. They're different. You know, they they don't have the, they, you know, they woke up one day and they got a million dollars and you a hundred million dollars. And look what happens to all the people, right? You always hear these stories of guys who win the lottery and it ruins their lives, right? Because they don't know what to do with it. If they, if they didn't work for it. They didn't build on it. It has and suddenly you know, everything. And you can do it over and over. We document that reported what had been decreed at the time. Right, that's, that's what the God's idea. asking us for. <laughs> he then says the last line on 445. Um, is a little bit easier to understand in the Hebrew. It says, "V'yasu mikdash, make for me a mikdash, like a Beit Hamikdash, right? Uh, uh, which is uh, the temple. Make for me a temple, v'shechanti v'socham, and I will live in it." Right? In other words, God, God says, "Make a place for me, and you, when you want to come and talk to me, I'll be there." Yes, I'm everywhere. I'm with you wherever you are. But if you want a special place, like we have a shul, you want a special place when you're in trouble and you're somebody's not well, you're having a problem, go to the shul and pray. Right? People do that throughout history. That's what they did. Yeah. Even if nobody yeah. else was in trouble, they went to shul. That's is where God is. Is God in your house? Yeah, God's in your house. God's, God's, God's with you anyway. God's with you. But we have a feeling, right? So God's saying, make for me a temple. I'll be there. I'll go there and you can come. But I purposely didn't translate it. Because there's a, a grammatical problem with the sentence. It says, the Asu no, Mikdash, make for me a temple. Okay, that's time. fine. That's then it says, the Shekhanti Yosoha. And there it says, I will live within you. It doesn't say, I will live, right, um, in it. It would be, with Shekhanti Yosoha, I will live in it. It says, I will live in you. Make for me a temple and I'll live in you. That's literally what it's translated. That's, on a simple level, it means make a temple. I'll be in the temple. You come there, and and I'll be there for you, right? 
On a deeper level, it means make yourself a temple. Make you, me. Because the word for temple, mikdash, holy, from kodesh, means the men uh, is is modifying the word kodesh, holy, of holy, a place of a place of holiness. A That's the idea. So make yourself a place of holiness, and I will dwell within you. That is God is saying, you, each one of us, have the ability to be holy, to be special, to be examples of of spirituality in the physical world. And if you work on doing that, I will be there with you. I'll be in you. I'll, I will be there with you. And that's an amazing statement, right, that, that God is with you. God is a part of you. You become God-like. Right? You know, you, for instance, you know, we hear stories about great rabbis who do miracles. Really, the rabbis aren't doing miracles. Really, what it is is that these people become close to God and then when they ask God for something, he responds. So let's say, I remember reading a story about Moshe Feinstein. He was a great rabbi. He died in the mid-1980s. I had the pleasure to speak with him a number of times. And Rabbi Feinstein says that, that, um, that people you know, would, um, would come to him to pray for somebody who was sick. Right? So he doesn't know the people. He doesn't know the sick person. Right? But they'd come and they'd meet with him privately and they'd say, you know, my mother's not well, my grandmother, my aunt, my brother, my whatever, not well. Would you pray for them? He says, of course, a Jew helps another Jew. I'll pray for them. What's their name? He tells them. So why does that work? Right? How does that work? That You pray for someone you don't even know who they are. How's that going to help that person? So the idea is as follows. For whatever reason it was that this person, got, in God's mind, got, this person needed to be sick. And the people who surrounded that person, it was, it is just that they should feel the pain. For whatever reason, I can't tell you the reason, that Mr. X's mother has to be sick and Mr. X has to feel the pain of his mother being sick and do whatever he can to help her. So he goes to Rabbi Feinstein, doesn't know the woman, right? He has no idea who she is. And, he, and the guy comes and he's in tears and he says, my mother is dying, my mother is sick, whatever it is. I want you, please, will you pray for her? So now what happens, Rabbi Feinstein cares about this guy. Okay? Whoever this man is, he has a feeling. He's another Jew, he feels for him. So now he's in pain because that woman's sick. So to speak, God looks down and says, look, it was just that she should be sick. It was just that her family should feel the pain. But this righteous man has nothing to do with them. He's feeling the pain too. That's not just. So God makes her better. Because he feels the pain. Rabbi, Rabbi Feinstein used to complain that people would come to him to pray for someone, but they'd never come back and tell him what happened. So he said, I could pray for somebody for a year, they'd be dead. I prayed for them for a year, they're better. I don't know. He says, he says they think I don't care. And I'm just doing that, you know, it's, like, it's just like a machine. You come, you ask me to pray, I pray. No, I care. I feel for them. I, I really feel. But I want to know what happened. You know, did, did my prayers help? Did the person get better? How did that? How did they help? I want to know that, right? And that's exactly what what happens. And that's really when it says that Rabbi Feinstein became holy. God was with him. It's not that Rabbi Feinstein did the miracle and she got better because of him. No, God did the miracle, but God did the miracle because of the intervention of of, of Rabbi Feinstein. You see this with graves. You know, when people go with graves to pray. So people have the misunderstanding that I'm going to go to the grave of this famous rabbi. And I'm going to pray to the rabbi to help me. I need to make a living, right? You can't do that. That's idol worship. Dead rabbis can't do anything for you. They're dead. Only God can help you. So then why do we go to the grave? So we go to the grave and we say to God, in the merit of this person who is so close to you, I'm inspired by the life of this person. Please, God, you, from the merit of this person, make my ex better, and I will be a better person. I'm inspired by this person. And so you, that, that's what we're doing. We're not saying, please, Rabbi, so-and-so, make my mother better. They can't. They're dead. They can't do anything. Right? But the merit of that person, God can do it. And it's actually forbidden to go and pray like that. It's forbidden. It's like praying to an idol. You can't do that. You go there to be inspired. You go there and ask God to intervene 
using the merit of this person. Because you know that if that person was alive, they would want to help. So that's what we do. That, that merit of that person, that's what it means that God is close to them. I mean, it tells us that if you make your will my will, it says in the ethics of our fathers, I will make my will your will. So God says that to us. If God says, if you make your will my will, you do what I tell you, follow the mitzvahs, make your, right, you do what I tell you to do, I will do what you need. You need me to help that person? Help there. I'm there. I'll do it. Because everything you want is what's good. Because you want what I want. So therefore, when you ask me for something, it's really what I want. I will do it. So that's what it means when God says that. And he does it. Yes? I So now we're going on to some of the descriptions of the things that are going to be found within this temple that we're building. On 446 and 447, it starts out, it says, they shall make an ark. The ark is the ark, like we keep the Torah in, of acacia wood. Two and a half cubits its length, a cubit and a half its width, a cubit and a half its height. You shall cover it with pure gold from within and from without. Let's just stop there. First thing you notice that all of the, the sizes, the height, the width, and the depth, are all halves. And there's no, there's not three, not, it doesn't say three amas, or let's say three yards, three feet, three meters. It says two and a half, two and a half, one and a half, two and a half. Like God made, is making, God's telling us, right? God can say anything he wants to say. He wants to say, make it eight by eight by eight. And that's what it would be. For some reason, he's saying two and a half, one and a half, two and a half. Why is that? So he's, what we're, he's illustrating here is that Something that's and a half is incomplete. It's not full. It's not three. It's two and a half. It's almost there. It's not there yet. And he's trying to, to show us by it not being a complete number that it only becomes complete by our involvement, by us working with it. Right? The, the our own itself, the ark that holds the Torah, is a holy thing because God makes it that way, but it's only useful with human endeavor, with human involvement. And so, so it's showing you, just like it says we had last week, we talked about the shekel. It said that the shekel, if you have to donate half a shekel to the temple. Every Jew has to give half a shekel. You say, well, why half a shekel? Why did God invent a, th a coin called a shekel? And then say you have to give half of one. Why didn't you just invent a shekel and say, and make the shekel worth half as much and say, give a shekel? Right? Why half a shekel? Right? In other words, like it's a funny thing that he creates the, the currency, and then the first I'm coming of the off. currency is half of it, right, that we all have to give. The answer is because no Jew is complete themselves. You have to join with other Jews, and you become complete. So two Jews make a whole shekel, and therefore you become whole. It's the same idea here, that the own itself is not complete until you bring together the people with it. That makes it complete. The next interesting thing about it is it says you should cover it with gold on the outside and the inside. That's what we call gold plated. There's gold plated on the outside, there's gold plated on the inside. Right? Like usually you buy a piece of jewelry, it's gold plated on the outside, because there is no inside. But here you have a box. The box is a gold on the outside. So anywhere you look at it, it's gold. But it isn't. It's got wood in the middle. So from this, the, the Talmud says that, that there was an argument in the, uh, among two rabbis as, as to what their students should be like. So one of the rabbis said the students should be like the other which is they should be the same on the inside as the outside. In other words, they want to, they want, you want to uh, look like a religious person, right? It's not enough to dress like a religious person. It has to be inside too. You have to feel it. You have to be that way. You can't just walk around wearing a black suit and a white shirt if that's your, 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 what you think a religious person wears. And, and on the inside, you're corrupt. You have to be inside just as holy as on the outside. Just like the gold is on the inside, it's the same on the outside, right? inside and out. It says, tohu kabaro, your inside is like your outside. 
That's you shouldn't right? you shouldn't be hypocritical with how you are. You should be the same person, both how you look and it works in the reverse too. If you're an observant person, you should dress with dignity. Right? Uh, uh, I see this all the time when I talk to people. Part of how we dress, of how we are as people, and the way that we look, right? that we you know, we go out of our way to dress nicely, is because we're representatives of God in the world. And therefore, if you, you don't dress with dignity, then you're not dignified. But today it's hard to tell. It used to be you could tell a person on social
what they do for this life, and the bottom of four forty seven. Of course, this baby is basically the answer to the question, my baby will be weak. And there were two of them on top of the ark, and it says that they were black, that they were made out of gold, and they had God in them. And that it says that when the Jewish people and God were happy with them, and they were going well, the two would be great. And when they weren't, they weren't going well, they were reversed. And that this was a sign to the Jews. You know how they were doing it. I was aware of 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 it. The way it's described, I need to say, or at least it's fine. This is an example of where the Torah speaks. It's talking about subtlety and I'm not going to go on. Because many of the commentaries understand what it means that they were embraced. And the two that they were embraced, they think they were. Because it says that when God told Moses to make the Torah, he didn't understand. 
Why, why would God put so many words in the book when we're able to pour in the guidance of God? How is it like that? How tall do you know that to be? When I've done with it, and you don't know where it is or what it is, I have no idea. But it's because of people. That's the way we do it. But before they understood that, You know, there's all the stories now about the Timor being taken by pirates. The rebels are going to kill them. You see, they are the type. Right? They are the type of show that the women are taken to Timor from the temple where they have to go. So there's been a long held belief by Jews that the Vatican has to be. But now the Vatican says it. And they, some of the answers they give are pretty logical. Because they say that if we had it, there were times in history when we would go. We would have dealt with it down the shore. It was like a nice six feet tall, pure gold. It was a lot of money. My dad's mother, one of them, they said we never had any food. Now, did they, did they not? I'm not a doctor.
Thank you. 